turned on, so I'll have a little <coughs> that comes up. Good evening, folks. Uh, just bear with us just for a second here. We're going to uh, see if we can um, improve uh, our simulcast. Bear with us. And we should be going live on YouTube in a second. Or on Facebook, I'm sorry. Okay, it looks like we're live on Facebook at the moment, and I just got to bring up the right screen. And uh, this one, and I need to bring on one of you guys to talk. There we go. Okay. So, I think we're up and running. Uh, looks like we're feeding out to YouTube okay, and Paul, can you uh, watch Facebook there for me? Yeah, I still don't... Okay, just try refreshing your screen. Bear with us, folks. We're just trying something here. <laughs> by the bay live. There we are. This is for COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> We're right, up. Okay, I see. We're good. We're good? Okay. Yes. Hey, good evening, folks. This is not easy for me. Uh, I'm running two laptops here and uh, a monitor on the side. Probably need a fourth <laughs> monitor really to, to keep things really running. Uh, we're keeping an eye on our COVID uh, partner down here in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, welcome oh, back to good. the page. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of the, the Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome back uh, Mike Powell from St. John. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> and I'd also like to welcome back uh, Paul Owen here from Hampton, both uh, amateur astronomers like Hello. myself, uh, who just enjoy sharing this hobby together. So I'll click on myself here now so I can do just a little bit of talk and let you know what we're going we have coming up. We have got a number of things lined up for you this evening. We're going to do a little bit of talk uh, about that nice show that's in our evening sky right now uh, at the moment with the planet uh, Venus and the beautiful Pleiades star cluster. And uh, Mike's going to give us his MacGyver segment on how to keep your telescope clear of dew. That's why we're talking about how to do astronomy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Paul's going to present uh, Rosanna's Fun Facts segment. Um, we've got a number of great uh, photo submissions to take a look at tonight. Um, we'll also be talking maybe a bit about Comet Atlas, that brightening comet that's coming up in our sky that will hopefully soon provide us with uh, some pretty pleasing views. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what's coming up over the next week. Also, uh, Paul's got uh, the moon actually right now live in, in his uh, scope, so we'll be offering that as well. So just uh, sit back and enjoy. And remember, this is a live broadcast, so if you have any questions at all about the night sky, we're very happy to try and answer them for you. So let's get started. Uh, with uh, Maybe we'll go with Mike's uh, presentation first of all. Uh, before we start, okay, before uh, we start go ahead. can you, can you uh, check to see if you're on YouTube? I don't see it on YouTube. Yep, we're up uh, live on YouTube for two minutes and 48 seconds right now. Okay, I, I guess it's, I, I'm not getting it on mine, that's all. Okay, maybe uh, refresh. That can bring you up. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look out on uh, Peter. There's Peter, the Wizard of Oz. He says, Chris, we're behind the curtain right now, <laughs> pulling all the levers <laughs> and pushing all the buttons to bring us another fan. Of Thanks, Peter. So uh, I, I assume we're, we're live and all good there, Peter, on your end. Um, yeah, he must be because he's commenting here as well. So Okay, good, good. That's fine. So, Don't worry about me. Okay, so I'll say good, uh, good evening to Robert and Ben. And um, who else will we get on here? Uh, Louis uh, MCA, uh, Stighorn's back, and um, Michael Stewart. Welcome, everybody. And uh, we're going to get started here with a, a little bit of... Uh, so where we go from now? <laughs> we're going to go now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do... Oh, did you... You were going to talk about uh, what people want. Oh, yeah, well, that, I'm going to bring that up at the end, really, too. Yeah, so I want to be sure that, like, we're offering these shows on a weekly basis. We're at, I guess this is episode 21 right now. So um, what we're looking at is trying to get some ideas for what you might have uh, that you'd want us to talk about on, on future episodes. So please um, give us some comments in the comments section, maybe when the video is over, or just let us know here in the comments as, as, we're, com as we're seeing comments come up on both screens here. Uh, let us know what you'd like us to talk about on future episodes. We're always willing to to take a topic and talk about it. That's what we do. Uh, we're here to teach. We're here to, to all learn together. So if you have anything that you'd like to discuss with us, anything that you'd like us to, to talk about in the future episodes, or maybe you'd like to be a special guest on one of our episodes, that's something that we're, we're going to talk about here too soon. So um, just leave us a comment in the comment section, and we can certainly uh, 
take a look at any of those topics uh, later on. I think there's enough uh, experience between the three of us that we can cover it off one way or the other. So that'll be the, the talk for the for the moment. And um, I guess we'll move on to uh, Mike. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Or Paul, do you want to go with the moon first? What would you? Are you clouded out up there? Or are you going to be good? No, no. I could... We should get the moon before the clouds come over because I'm clouded here in St. John, Paul. Okay, no okay. problem. I'll I'll, uh, I'll offer you the moon. All right, let me get switched over to you first of all on both screens here. So Facebook and YouTube both. There we go. I got two mics going. I've got two laptops. <laughs> and you should be able to see the moon. There she be. There, there she, she be. be. There she be. She's getting she's getting close to being full. So give me a second. I'm gonna enlarge both screens here too. So let me sure that yeah. we have full view, uh, full screen on that one, and we'll go full screen over here. There. So it is getting close to full. It's, uh, what is it that now? It must be close to 90%, I guess, because uh, full moon, I guess, is on Tuesday night. Uh, the pink, uh, the pink moon, apparently. The pink moon. Yeah. All and it's right. not pink because it's, it's not going to be pink rising over the horizon, of course. It's going to be pink because uh, it's the name of a f special flower, apparently, that blooms in the spring. Would it be so the crocus? That could be. Oh, okay. There, so. And what we're looking at is our moon at about uh, 360,000 kilometers, I guess, tonight. Um, it'll be about 357,000 kilometers, I believe, on uh, Tuesday night, which means that's the third uh, supermoon of the year, and the fourth one will actually be in May. But this will be the largest supermoon, or the, the closest. There, look at that for a supermoon. <laughs> there, we're getting more super. Everybody um, in the uh, the largest supermoon um, of the year, actually, the um, because it's at uh, the closest perigee, which means that's the clo closest point that the moon uh, gets to us in its cycle. Now, a supermoon is defined as a, a moon that uh, becomes almost perigee or within 90% of the perigee distance uh, when it turns full. And that was the definition given out, I guess, in, in the year, uh, early 90s. But it really doesn't mean much. Uh, and simply the fact is that when it's a supermoon, it's about 13% larger than it is when it's called a puny moon or a micro moon. So when the moon is at, so the moon goes around uh, Earth in an elliptical orbit. At times it's closer to us than it is at other times. So if it's really close to us and it's a full moon, then um, if it's within 10% uh, of its perigee, a uh, close point to us, then we call it a supermoon. And if it's on the other end, where it's farther away from us, and it's a full moon, we call it an apogee moon. A perigee and an apogee are the real uh, two terms. So, but anyway, that's a beautiful view there, Paul. What are you? So, what are you shooting with tonight? Um, I'm just <clears throat> going to try and get a little bit better focus here for you. Um, just one sec here. Peter there says, "I'm sorry." Peter says it's 93% right now. Thank you, Peter. 93%. Um, there is that a little better view there now. Oh, that's great. I'm just trying to get so that that's probably too much. Um, I had it last night, but I was playing with my optics this afternoon. Okay, I'll show you what I'm using actually to to, uh, to take this. I'm just going to shrink this down, and we'll open this up. And so basically, what you're seeing right there, this is out in my observatory right now, and I'm using um, a Celestron Edge uh, HD uh, eight-inch Smith Cassegrain uh, telescope on my uh, EQ6R. Um, uh, Skywatcher German equatorial mount and um, I've got it reduced so that you can't see it right there but there's a reducer here and then there's a, a focuser uh, which is operated inside the house here and then of course my little uh, 294 uh, camera from ZWO and that basically is pointing towards the moon so that's what you're that's what we're looking through right at the moment and I'll bring this back up here now um, and there's the moon, and that's what we're looking at, and that's what we're looking at it through. Nice. Beautiful. Mike, I, I don't know if you've got Facebook up or not. Um, I don't know if, or if either one of you guys can check to see if the volume's okay on Facebook. And anybody commenting back on Facebook? Again, um, I'm, I'm only able to see the YouTube comments at the moment. So. Okay, uh, just a look. A lot of people saying hello. Good. Um, okay, perfect. I'll, I'll type in. Let me just see here. Uh, uh, the sole simulcasting thing is a little bit more difficult when you don't have a, a third-party program to, to run them out. Oh, well, so. fine. We'll <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well, if we aren't, we aren't. 
Oh, okay. So, but it looks good on Facebook from what good. I can see. Perfect. Okay. And um, yeah. So anyway, so that's so. Uh, that's the moon as it sits right now. It's still relatively low in the horizon. So um, as it gets a little bit higher, um, there'll be a little bit less turbulence that we'll have to go through. Last night was fantastic. Yeah, it was beautiful. Um, yeah, I got a really, really nice shoot. And we'll later down, I'll, when we do pictures, I'll show you that one. But uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, it was what I've got shot last night was taken with this exact system that I just showed you. So you'll you'll be familiar with that. But um, we're, right now, Mike and I both use uh, SharpCap to capture uh, the soft, uh, the, the, the images. And that's the software that we use because it's just so flexible. It works so well. And um, yeah, that's what I'm using tonight. Beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful moon there tonight. And it's, it's so incredible to be able to capture it like this and offer it live. I mean, we're all, we're all right now sitting underneath the same moon. Not very much movement there at all, Paul, is there? Like atmospheric. No, I'm, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in a little closer. Have another yeah, little sure. closer. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Tycho sitting there. There's Tycho and all that nice ejecta ray. And it's not quite in focus, so you go you can chat away and I'll just I'll just play with the focus and get it so it's a little cleaner. Okay. I'm just uh, looking for I was looking for my notes on Tycho here actually, but might be a minute. Mike, sing us a song. <laughs> yeah. That's the last time you were here. Song tonight. There we go. Blue moon, blue moon, blue moon. I can play some music for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's spin up to the Copernicus here. I got a few notes on that. Copernicus? That's, let's roll right over to Copernicus. Here we go. We can do that. Know, there it is. There it is. Look at that. Copernicus. Oops, there it is. Sitting, oops, there it is. Sitting in the ocean of storms. That was Oceanus. a song I was going to sing, too. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let it stop you now. Go ahead. Oops, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Copernicus, uh, 93 kilometers in diameter, that little crater is right there. And uh, it's actually 3.8 kilometers deep. Like, I like to think about that distance there. It's it's unreal to think that a crater is 3.8 kilometers deep. Like, So that would fit roughly between St. John and Fredericton, I guess, about 100 kilometers. So you wonder, like, if you're sitting somewhere uh, halfway between the two, would you believe that you're inside a crater? Um, the, the floor on that is fairly smooth, um, but there is a couple of uh, mountain peaks actually in the middle of it that do rise up about uh, one and a half kilometers high. So, uh, But still, you'd be driving along there uh, you know, for 30 or 40 kilometers and maybe not even realize you're inside a crater. Um, but the walls do, they're terraced walls, so they um, it was impacted by a meteor, of course, and um, there, it cr caused steps, basically, running down on either side uh three sets of steps i guess terraced walls that lead down to the to the floor of the crater over uh 3.8 kilometers <coughs> this one is actually uh very easily visible in binoculars um as we get to our, our full moon phase and all the way down through like we're at waxing gibbous phase right now so the moon's getting larger in the sky when it's waxing and it's getting smaller when it's waning and we're at a gibbous phase so that means that we're larger than uh one half of the moon in the sky which we would call a first or third quarter moon. So anyway, we're waxing up to, uh, we're waxing gibbous up to a full moon phase, and then we'll be waning gibbous uh, down to the third quarter moon. And we'll lose it a little bit around that time, but we're gonna be, we're gonna have it here for a while. So it's really nice and prominent. Uh, even when the moon is like this, when you're looking around here, it's really difficult to see a lot of the features because we're not uh, following the line of the Terminator, which is the line that separates day and night in the moon. Now on that line uh, on the moon, if you were standing there, it would be like sunset, so you'd have these long shadows cast behind you. So if we look out at the left-hand edge there, we can see that the crater definition is more pronounced there because uh, shadows are being cast down into the walls of the craters. There's nice Play-Doh right up there in the corner too, uh, in, this, in the Bay of Rainbows there. Um, so yeah, the the, uh, the edge there of the moon, you can see that some of the definition is a little bit more pronounced there than it is over in the other area around Copernicus. Like there are lots of craters in around Copernicus too, but we just can't seem to pick them out as much because it's like the sun is directly overhead and it's really not casting many shadows. So if the sun is over our heads in the summertime, we don't cast a shadow at all. So it's the same kind of appearance here, but there's still lots and lots on the moon uh, to reveal for sure. Paul's going to bring up a photo here a little bit later, uh, his capture from last night. Amazing uh, thing, and I'd get to zoom in on that too, Paul. When you when you do bring it up, 
Yeah, well, actually, if you want, I can uh, I can switch over and pick it up now if you like. Sure, okay. Let's let's try that. We'll compare that against this live view, and okay. I'll show you the difference when we when you get to capture an image of the moon, and uh, versus the live view. Now, this live view is still nice because it is live for sure. Yeah, I'm just gonna switch down and find out where it is tonight's April's moon. That should be it right there, I okay. think. Yeah, that's it. So there we go. There's last night's moon. So can you see it? Sure oh, yeah. can. Yeah, nice and crisp and clear. So, so um, let's uh, let's just zoom in a little bit. Mm. So now you're talking about Copernicus and the yeah. uh, terrace mm -hmm. walls. Let's bring that up. Yeah, put that right in the middle there. That'd be right great. There. And zoom in on that guy. So now we can really take a look around. So this is the advantage that Paul mentioned there before is that when you start to capture a photo like this um, of the moon, you can go back later and take a look at. Uh, the photo and uh, it'll reveal a whole lot more detail. So if you want to study a certain part of the moon, this is the way to do it. Like he, he had mentioned before, I, I go out and do a, a Facebook live feed and you know, I'm online for an hour and a half or whatever and I'm looking at the moon, but I'm not really capturing it like this. But this is a great way to study the moon. So you could go out and snap a photo of a certain area of the moon and then go back and, and study up on it like this area, Copernicus here. Now you can use even, zoom in even more than that, I'm sure, Paul. That that was a really high definition uh, photo that you had there. Look at that. Yeah, right about, I'm so, pushing it right about there. Yeah, lots and lots of, of terrace. So, millimeters, so. so we can see the terraced walls there. We can see the mountain peaks in the center, those two central peaks there. Those, those are yeah. about 1.2 kilometers high each there. And lots of ejecta rays scattered out in all directions there. Uh, this crater floor has not been flooded by lava, probably because of its recent formation. The central peaks consist of three isolated mountains rising about 1.2 kilometers above the crater floor. Another one right there. Yeah, and uh, the crater rays spread out about 800 kilometers in all directions from the surrounding mare, overlapping the rays from Aristarchus and Kepler, which are the other two. Uh, we'd actually we'd have to zoom out to get them, I guess. Well, there is that them there. Aristarchus and Kepler. Their Kepler's down below there, sorry, yeah. Right here? Yeah. So. Um, actually, Apollo 12 landed just south of Copernicus on the mare basalts of Oceanus Procellarum. So that's that big, large area that we see, the large, big, dark area there is, is a maria, or it's uh, actually, we, it's called Oceanus Procellarum, or the Ocean of Storms. Um, the other areas were, um, there's a Bay of Rainbows up there in the corner too. Um, the other areas were called the Seas, uh, Sea of Tranquility, Sea of Serenity, Sea of Fertility, Sea of Crises. <clears throat> but this one looks so big so that they call it an ocean. So, <clears throat> uh, and it covers a large portion of the uh, of the near side of the moon that we're looking at here. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, those are, that's, that's basalt that we're looking at there. Um, actually, large, dark volcanic plains that had flooded out. Uh, from a uh, period of uh, the moon's uh, uh, life uh, called the uh, period of heavy bombardment when the moon was bombarded by lots and lots and lots of, of large meteors. And of course, when they hit the moon, there's nothing really to slow them down at all. It's, uh, there's no friction uh, because there's no air in the moon. So they would release all of their energy at once. And uh, a lot of them, when they impacted the moon, uh, they would tear down through the, the moon's crust when it was on its early time. And they would bring lava up to the surface, and then that lava would uh, cool down and darken over time, and would end up with these large, uh, large dark areas here. Very nice, nice definition there. Lots of look at the detail there, and the, the amount of craters that we can see as we approach that Terminator line uh, down there on the bottom, bottom right, right. And as it floats right down along the bottom there, I guess. Yeah, so big Tycho there in the, in the center with those rays that extend out about 1,600 kilometers in all directions there. That one's about 108 million years old, we believe, that crater. And uh, there was, you know, there was a theory at one time that we thought it was uh, part of uh, a, lar a large asteroid that came in and collided with the moon and part of it broke off and ended up uh, colliding with Earth and led to the extinction of the dinosaurs back 65 million years ago. But I think that's been kind of disproven now, but there was some thought about that. I'm just looking around at a lot of the detail here. It's it's incredible. Yeah, look, how, look how far up that ejector ray goes. Well, 1,800 kilometers, yeah. Way, way, way up to here. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. 
Actually, uh, Copernicus was going to be the site of the Apollo 20 mission. It was one of the uh, one of the uh, projected sites, or one of the uh, selected sites, I guess, of Apollo 20 that were going to land right inside the crater. I suppose at 3.6 kilometers, you could do that because it would be <laughs> large enough. You know, as long as you didn't land, land, land on that mountain peak on the middle. I, I think uh, he could fly that manually in there again, couldn't he? Probably could, yeah. <laughs> uh, he probably could. Uh, so yeah, lots lots of detail there tonight. This is what this is what you capture. So how did you capture that, Paul? Can you give us some okay. detail? So on basically, um, here I'll turn off the picture. Um, so basically, that rig that I showed you earlier um, was how I got that. And the moon kind of looks like this when you're playing around with it. But the whole idea is to stack a bunch. So if I want to take a picture, say of this, it's real simple. I just go up here and just say capture. Start my capture. If I want to take, say, 190 picture, there it is right there. I just hit start. Ping. That's it. Right now, I am, uh, if you look down the bottom frame, I've got 8, 9, 10, 11. So it takes about a minute and 30 seconds to get about 190 pictures. And once they're done, you just take it out of that, throw it into either Registax or Auto Stacker, stack it all up, and then throw it into Photoshop, do some sharpening, and there's your picture. It's really quite simple. I can do a picture like that from a, from like this. Probably 15 minutes, like I have a, the picture that you just saw. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Amazing capture. Unreal. Thanks. Wow. Yeah. All right. So, so, so that's, that's, that's the way to do it is, is, to, is to get a capture like this. Get Paul to send you one. That's the best way. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and he can, he wants he, a moon picture, let me know. I'll send you one. He'll send you <laughs> with all the labels on it. Every crater will be labeled on it, too. All 300,000 there that are over one kilometer. <laughs> so there are over 300,000 craters on just the near side of the moon that are over one kilometer in, in, uh, in size. So. Wow. That's uh, that's the incredible part. Now I'm, I'm watching myself here on two laptops, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm staying in the image. I'm kind of just off to one side for Facebook and yeah. back again. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, go ahead. I, I'll, where, you're, where you want me to look at Facebook? I just want to say hi to Susan and Sophie and Eric and Kevin and Angela. <coughs> hi everybody. Uh, Chris has got his hands full, so we're, I'm trying to help him out here. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. Any comments there, Paul, that uh, we need to discuss before we get off uh, the moon? Or they questions? said the sound was great. Thank you, Amber. Okay. And um, Kevin McClessick says, hey, boys, I just was looking at a program for taking photo of the stars on the moon. Nice. Oh, very good. Very good. So other than that, um, Peter Vasima. Mm -hmm. uh, he's well, somebody's juggling Facebook and YouTube, so there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, Peter is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's that's you're you're now up to date. Perfect. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. So we're back to the live. Maybe back to your live shot. Do you still got the live up there? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. I didn't, but I do now. Okay, there we are. So there's the difference with a live shot and what you can capture with a with the video. Now there's there we go. There's some clouds moving in. So I guess yeah, we did we, we did hit timing. this at the right time. Yeah. <laughs> Just right. All Look right. at that. <laughs> okay, so we're, okay. we're getting clouded out, so I'm going to give you back to Chris. I'm going to stop sharing here. Just Great. one sec. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, they come in pretty quick. It sure did. There you go. There. There perfect. we are. All Where's right. Good timing. So uh, where should we go now, guys? We'll either go to uh, the photos or we'll go to – let's go to Mike Guyver. How about that? Are yeah. you ready, Mike? Well, I was, was going to throw, <laughs> throw a photo at you. I got a quick photo of uh, Comet Atlas. Okay, perfect, yeah. If you want to have a peek Absolutely, we do, yep. So I'll just share my screen here. Come on. Why is my share not coming up? I don't know why my share is not coming up. Top Am right I still hand, there? Yep, top right-hand corner, three dots. Yeah. Uh, it's not letting me share. Yeah, it's blanked out. It's not letting me share. Oh, that's Hold fun. on. Okay. You guys keep busy. I'll pop out and pop back in again. Okay, sounds good. All right. I'm just slowing back to home position because when Mike starts, I'm going to go out and close my roof because okay. it's clouded over. So. Well, this is what happens when you're when you're live. Uh, we do uh, run into little bloops. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> but it's still it's still worth being live. So we're not we're not a professional show here, guys. We're just uh, going along by the seat of our pants most times. But it's a lot of fun. It is. Okay, so let's uh, – maybe what we'll do is uh, – I'll see if I can bring up a couple of photos. Yeah. I'm going to say uh, a shout-out to, hey, Emma, how you doing in Moncton? Hi, Amber. There's hey, Mike. Pat and Alan. Good, good evening. Hello, Gail. 
Um, that's all the Facebook okay. people. I'm just going to click on the right mic here. <laughs> oh, there's I two mics two, now. two mics up now. Let's get the right guy. Here's one. It's a mic mic. <laughs> and uh, see if we can find I'm the other one. one. Oh, you are. Oh, well, not really. <laughs> well, here. I, th I think the other I'll one was pretty. Perfect. There we go. I'll share my screen. Okay. If you look quickly here. Where my mouse is circling? Yes. That is Comet Atlas. I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit. Oh, nice. Oh, there it is. I can see it. Yeah. Mm. Right so, here. When did you capture that, Mike? I took that on uh, March 25th. Okay. Nice. I just uh, I was out tinkering around, and I thought, well, I'll fire my scope up in that direction and just see if there's anything there. And uh, after about, a, I think it was a 45-second shot, uh, sure enough, there it was. Nice. <laughs> So nice. that's up and around Cassiopeia. No, that one's up off the Big Dipper. Oh, top, okay. That's that's uh, Y one or Y four? Is that the is that the uh, one that we're doing all the talking about? There, you dropped off the other one, so that's good. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that's supposed to brighten to hopefully uh, naked eye. Yeah, that's that's uh, eight, I guess, right now. It may be today. So that's that's uh, C twenty nineteen Y four. Which is, uh, I guess, why four means it was discovered in the the um, in 2019 in the fourth quarter, I guess, so last three months. So it was discovered in December, and back in December, that was only a magnitude uh, 19 or something, 18. So it's it's brightened a thousandfold since uh, since December. Unreal. So it's wow. now developing a tail, and um, they're saying that tail is about three million kilometers long. Um, so it's it's beginning to brighten a bit. And uh, we're really hoping that this is going to be a, uh, a naked eye comet. We're due for one. It's been, what, since 2009, I guess, uh, 11 years or so since we've had a really nice comet. Even before that, uh, for some really nice ones. But uh, they're, we're really not sure about this one. It's, it's, I mean, comets are unpredictable for sure. Uh, this one could be part of what, what they called the, uh, the Great Comet of 1844, I guess it was. Just a second, I can minimize the screen here. There. Um, there was a comet back in uh, 1844 that was called the Great Comet, and uh, this may be a fragment off of it. Of course, it comes out from the Oort cloud, quite a ways out past the solar system. I guess it's if you want to call that part of the solar system, some do. Uh, it's still uh, it's still out there, but uh, it's about a 4,000 year period comet. So uh, I'm probably not going to get to see it again. Uh, it is it is brightening, and uh, it, they are expecting it to brighten even more. It's still out. Uh, I think it's just passing the orbit of Mars right now, um, so it's getting closer to us, and it will not come close to us by any means. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, perihelion distance was now, but it, I know it's uh, it's not really close. It's millions of kilometers anyway. And then it's going to zoom into the uh, past the orbit of Venus, and then spin around the the sun eventually, and. When it does, uh, I've actually I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint thing here. I'm just going to show for a few slides to show where where it is and where we expect it to be uh, into April and May. And May is going to be fairly low or in the sky, a lot lower than it is now, but uh, it should be brightened by that time they're expecting. So we're going from a magnitude eight, hopefully down to I guess naked eye would be about six maybe something yeah, like six, that. Yeah. I guess six. So. Uh, we could come up to magnitudes in, in that short of time, hopefully, and then maybe it'll even be uh, uh, naked eye and, and a really nice bright one. So, uh, the comets are really unpredictable. Right now, it's, of course, giving outgassing a lot of its material and thousands of tons that are dragging behind it. Uh, it has uh, two, two tails, a, a dust tail and an ion tail. Um, so the, the head of it is, is basically... Uh, you know, covered with uh, material that's being blasted off into space behind it. So they're 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 more like a diffused object. They're not uh, they're not really bright and pinpoint like a star is, uh, unless they get you know really in a really dark sky and you really get a nice view of one. So we're hoping that this is going to brighten up some, and uh, we'll keep you all posted as to what happens uh, shortly down the road. Uh, got a question here from Trudy, uh, Paul. Would the DSLR alone capture that yet? Capture with the comet? Yeah, the comet. Um, depending on your the focal length of your telescope, mm -hmm. but yes. I think oh, 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 the DSLR by itself. If yeah. you have uh, if you have um, um, a relatively uh, long focal length, it will. So okay. if you've got like a you know a four hundred three four hundred millimeter uh, focal length on your camera, it should pick it up uh, as a small object, but it should pick it up. Yeah, this particular shot was uh, with a 475 millimeter focal length, so 
a 300 millimeter camera uh, lens should pick it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, how, how cropped is that, Mike? Uh, that, it, what do you mean here? There's a full full shot with a four thirds chip. Okay, so you didn't crop that at all? No. I okay, just, well, uh, yeah, because that's exactly what Judy has. She's got a, an APS-C size uh, sensor. So uh, that view that Mike picked up with his 450? 475. 475. So if you've got a 300, it'll be a little wider than that, but you should still be able to see it. Yeah, you should. Because you can crop it in a little bit if you had to. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Mike. Not no worries. I'll stop um, sharing that screen. We're going to jump to things pretty quickly now. We're already into half an hour of our show. I want to get Mike on here doing his MacGyver segment. We've got a Rosanna's piece. I'm just going to bring up this little bit of Comet uh, thing here just quickly, if I can. Um, so we'll start from beginning. And I'm going to be... Uh, oh, hang on. i got to share my screen. Don't I? Uh, welcome, Tim, Libby, <laughs> and uh, hi, Angela, and hi, Amber. So... Okay, share screen, and I'm going to share screen one, and I'll try this again. So let's go over here to uh, the comet. Can you guys see that display at the moment? Yeah. Okay, so let me click on myself on the Facebook feed as well. Here we go. Okay, so just a little bit about Comet uh, C29 Y4 Atlas. I just put a few slides together. It's not much. Um, so um, comets, of course, have two tails. One uh, white one is made of comet dust particles. Blue one is made of electrically charged gas. And the comet, uh, the coma is the cloud of comet dust particles that are surrounding the nucleus at the center. The nucleus is solid, an icy heart of comet inside the cloud of uh, coma. So that's what they're made out of. Uh, here's a chart from Heavens Above just today. So we're looking at here, actually, there are three uh, comets that are visible in telescopes, I'll call them, uh, that Magnitude 12 and 14, they're, they're quite quite a far uh, way out. But C2019 uh, Y4 Atlas is the one we're talking about. Its brightness has moved up to magnitude 8 now. Uh, and it last dated reports. So people look at these, compare them to stars and other known uh, objects of a certain magnitude or a certain brightness. And that's where we come up with a number. Uh, so this one is actually in, in the constellation Camelo, Camelopardalis. Camelopardalis, yeah. Expialidocious. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we also have C2017 uh, T2 Pan Stars, uh, which is in Cassiopeia, and a third one here, C2019 Y1 Atlas, which would have been discovered in the first three months of 2019, and that's also in the constellation of Cassiopeia. So there's three comets there in your evening sky if you know where to look for them. And uh, the Heavens Above website, if you go to that, type heavensabove.com, and then just click uh, in the top right-hand corner your location. So ours is, of course, St. John. Once you do that, go down to the bottom and click Update, and then come up to a screen. You'll have a whole pile of menus there. One of the menus will be Comets. And once you click on those, uh, it'll bring up this menu of Comets that are available to view. And if I could click on that uh, that button, which I didn't copy, uh, really, that's that's a link, really. So when you click on that link, it'll bring up a piece of the sky, and it'll show you exactly where that comet is in the sky uh, for that evening. Now, I just want to show you a little real quick clip. I don't know if this is going to work or not. We'll try it. I'm gonna, I might have to drag it over from here this is the twitter little uh, link i found hang on we'll find it again and comet atlas last night from my backyard over a period of approximately five hours this guy says so here it is that's moving pretty quick mm. just over five hours so nice nice capture there and that's just from a twitter feed that i copied out from somebody so pretty neat to see um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide real quick. So there's a, there's another image of it right there with a nice green head, uh, uh, coma head on it there. So if we're looking into early April, um, if we follow the Big Dipper up in our evening sky, it's turned upside down here. Uh, between the Big Dipper, if we just take those uh, last, those two stars that make up the, the pot there, follow them straight down about the same distance out, and you're going to be into uh, Comet Atlas. Pretty well where we would find uh, <coughs> M81 and M82, the two galaxies that we, we tend to show a lot. I think just out past that, just a little ways. So that's early April. That's over the next uh, week or so. Here we are into the, around the middle of April. Now here's the Big Dipper again. And we've come out quite a ways now to this bright star Capella. Of course, here's Venus. So now we're looking over, uh, we're looking over to our, our 
southwest northwestern sky, I guess. And uh, we've got Bright Capella there, and then it's sitting be uh, between Bright Capella and uh, the edge of the Big Dipper. So there's where we're sitting at that point, and and uh, around April 15th. Here we are at the end of April, so it's moved down closer to Capella at that time. Here's Venus still in our, our evening sky. So you find Venus, find your way up to Capella, and then just about the same distance again out from Capella is where we'll find it. But again, if you went to the Heavens Above website, and brought up the uh, the actual comet, and you can click on a star map, which will show you exactly where it is. And here we are around May 15th, so uh, Venus Capella in the sky. Venus has, of course, dropped a lot lower in the evening sky because it's now getting to the point where it's going to be dropping between us and the sun. Uh, but then here's co uh, Comet uh, Y4 Atlas right there. Hopefully at this point, and we're talking around May 15th, we're still going to get a nice view of it, and we're hoping at this point it's going to be nice and bright. So uh, this is what we're expecting over the next little while. A lot, of, a lot of astronomers are saying, yes, it will brighten up. But again, comets are very, very unpredictable. So uh, it's difficult to say whether it will uh, pan out for us or not. But we just have to wait and see what happens. So uh, I guess we're back, Mike, to you. Okay. And let me uh, unshare my screen here. And uh, bring you back up. I'll and share my screen one. here. Okay, let me bring up on the other one here. Here we are, Mr. Mike Giver. <laughs> <laughs> I can put that helmet back on if you like. And, and do the whole thing with it. That'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> if you can think it's still talk, but I might oh. have a different voice when I do. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> looks like Mike or Paul's must have stepped away. He went out to close his uh, observatory, I guess. Yeah. The roof. Yeah, it's getting yeah. Uh, getting cloudy. Yeah. So tonight, uh, one thing I wanted to talk about was. Uh, you know, the, the, what I do with uh, my Giver segments, it's what I do, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> try to find ways to do things a little less expensive or a little cheaper than uh, than you can if you go out and buy the Oops. official stuff for astronomy. Sorry, just a second. There we go. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, everybody who owns a telescope uh, and has been out there overnight and the wee hours of the morning uh, is your telescope tends to have a or do up on you whether the mirrors do up or the lenses do up or whatever. So you want to use a dew heater. Well, you look around, uh, you know, the biggest name that I found out there is probably Kendrick. It's the one I use the most. It's all, all my stuff is Kendrick. But when you, when you look at it and you say, what am I getting? I'm getting a strap and I'm getting a cord that plugs into a box. And the strap itself, if you wanted to do an eight inch scope, you're looking at a, you know, a hundred dollars. For, for the price of a single strap. And then you have to buy a controller for it on top of that. So you get the new controller and there's probably, you know, if you buy one used another hundred bucks. So just one new strap and one controller, you're talking $200. And all it's doing is keeping the dew off your lid. Well, trying to figure out if there's a better way to do it. I was surfing eBay one day and I came across something and I went, hey, that might work. And it was a coffee cup warmer uh, that runs on USB. So I thought, well, all I got to do is wrap that around the scope and I'd have myself a do here. Well, unfortunately, I have no scope small enough for this particular one. Uh, I do have a 50 millimeter scope and it does wrap around, but you can wrap it around the camera lens if you're out doing photography. And there you have a USB powered dew shield or dew heater for your camera lens. Now, you say, okay, it's USB powered. Do I need a laptop to power it? You know, well, yes, you can run it off laptop. You can run it off computer or you can run it off these USB charging packs that you buy for your phone. And uh, there you go. You get yourself a very inexpensive dew heater. This one was $4 on eBay, free shipping. Oh. I got an inexpensive dew heater for you know your camera lens or a very small telescope it does fit over say a 50 millimeter finder scope so if you wanted to put it on a finder scope it would keep from doing up the problem is you can't control the heat well for four bucks i'm not too worried about it but after a while of doing some more searching i thought you know that's an ingenious idea why hasn't somebody invented that for telescopes lo and behold we've uh, if you've been out there Surfing the net, looking for telescope parts you've, on eBay, you've come across a company called SD Boney, mm -hmm. and uh, they make 
a dew strap for USB power for your telescope. Now, they sell in three different sizes. There's a 25 millimeter, a 30 millimeter, and a four, or a centimeter, sorry, 25, 30, and 40 centimeter. This one here happens to be a 40 centimeter. And if you have a four inch or a, an 80 or 90 millimeter scope, it's the perfect dew heater. And that, you can buy three of them for 50 bucks as opposed to buying one strap, an actual Kendrick dew strap for 100. Mm. Well, all right, it's still USB powered. How do you control the temperature? They come up with a USB powered controller that comes with the strap. You plug it in, you plug it into your battery pack or your laptop or whatever it is you're using, and you can dial up the heat. <laughs> and so now you actually have a dew strap that you can adjust the heat with just like you can with, uh, you know, the, the 12 volt ones only it runs on five volts and it's a lot cheaper. And I'll tell you, this sucker warms up pretty good when you crank it high. When you turn it down, you can set it to whatever you need. The other part is you're running USB if you're doing photography or something out there anyway. It, it'll plug into a USB hub and you can power it that way off your laptop. Or, or again, if you wanted to use a battery pack, that's fine. But, you know, to have three of these totally adjustable and to take something like this and strap it to the leg of your scope plug it in and you got a dew heater all night long that'll keep the dew off your your scope and again uh, the sv boney is putting them out there they're looking at making uh when i was trying to do some research i come across a couple of uh different forms where the guys were saying they were in contact with sv boney and they're looking at making longer straps up to be able to, to wrap an eight inch scope i don't know nine and a quarter 11 inch scope and so on so you'll be running able to run everything off a usb hub in your observatory, or if you're out in the field, you can run them off these battery packs. Now, I wondered how long, how much does current does it draw? I couldn't get much information on actually how much current it draws, but I decided I'd plug it into this uh, battery pack I have here, and this one is uh, 1100, sorry, 11,000 milliamps. This battery pack that came with my sister's Hyundai car, I plugged it in, and uh, it went three days before the battery was dead. Wow. <laughs> so you can definitely get a night out of it anyway. <clears throat> nice. So the best part is, again, you can buy three of these straps for 50 bucks and plug it into a USB port. Or you can go out and buy a dew controller, a dew strap, and put everything together. And normally you know, the basic cost to... To take a C8 or something like that, put a dew heater on the the corrector plate and put it on the eyepiece. You're putting yourself in the vicinity of three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good way to go. It's nice, easy on the pocketbook, and uh, you know the fact that they give you the the actual now you can control the voltage going to it and adjust the heat. That just makes it that much better and more up my alley for price anyway. <laughs> that's what it's all about. <laughs> Keep that price low. Now, that's great, that was, Mike. That was a quick little talk on, on, on the, the dew heaters and, and I think a way to, you know, do it cheaper. But I wanted to show you quickly something else that I come up with, uh, you know, when we're out doing star parties and stuff. Everybody talks about buying these anti-vibration pads and things for their telescopes. I find that 90% of the time I'm set up on grass or sand or dirt somewhere. So I really don't need an anti-vibration pad because the ground takes it up. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the problem I do have is that the legs will sink in the sand or in the in the mud or in the grass. <clears throat> so what I come up with was to take a piece of plywood, three quarter inch. This one here is cut six by six. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's my smoker's cough. I used a uh, a step drill, drilled a three quarter inch hole, and now I set that down in my tripod leg goes into that and it doesn't sink and it holds my tripod steady all night long three of those cut out of a piece of plywood cost me nothing i painted them orange because i don't have orange feet for my scope <laughs> 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 then i wanted to get back at chris so that's why they're orange and uh it's a simple way to keep your scope from sinking into the grass or dirt or or in the sand when you're at the beach and it doesn't cost you nothing a little piece of wood and a 
and drill a hole in it. And it works far better than the uh, vibration pads that I bought that sunk into the sand. I, I actually lost one. So. <laughs> That's awesome, That's Mike. That's awesome. And it, and it is all about accessories. Emma says you're a genius, Mike. <laughs> That's well, that's well known. <laughs> that and that that is it's 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 uh, the cheaper we can make the accessories, and Mike is the guy to be able to do that for you. The, the more money we're going to have to buy that little scope, like he's got sitting there behind him. So we want to spend the, the the dollars on the on the uh, the really important stuff. And uh, but accessorizing is is really what it's all about too, because you can get out there in an evening and and it can ruin your uh, do can really ruin your evening for sure very quickly, it, right? It do. It do, <laughs> it do do that, do. it do do that. <laughs> diddly That's diddly do. I knew. That's what he. <laughs> oh, I knew that was coming. Uh, anyway, I had to expect it. Well, thanks, Mike. That's perfect. Uh, perfect uh, information there on uh, getting yourself set up for dew heating uh, your telescope. And dew is a, an issue for all of us. Um, especially in the, the uh, more humid climates, I guess. But even around here, we, we do get it quite a bit. We do get it quite a bit. Anyway, we'll carry on. <laughs> you have to get away from it. <laughs> I think I, I think we beat that one right with a beat that one to death. That That's right. a do, donkey. That's a <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe what we'll do now is we'll, uh, Paul, do you want to do uh, Rosanna's fun? Oh, hang on. I got to get queued up for that one. Um, or do we want to just take a look at some photos here first, maybe? Uh, Whatever anyway, you want to do. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Okay, let's do let's do uh, let's do a few photos really <laughs> really really quick. Okay, <laughs> let's bring them up. Uh, so um, okay, I want to uh, thank everybody for submitting their photos. First of all, uh, online they've been uh, been really nice to be able to receive them. I'm going to share my desktop here for a second, and I'm going to share this screen here. Okay. And uh, so um, I've got a number of uh, entries uh, that came in, uh, not entries, uh, submissions, I guess. And it's really great to receive them because uh, sometimes we run into material for our show and, and it's just nice to be able to to, uh, to focus on uh, what somebody else is capturing out there for sure. So let me bring up a few that, that we're sending this week. Here's one from uh, Cheryl Stephen. Cheryl attended our workshop in Hampton this week, or uh, back uh, when we had started it up. Uh, I guess we only got through the one week before everything else came out and about, though. But uh, we've got a nice shot here of the uh, the waxing crescent moon and Venus together, which wow. uh, really has been a really nice show over the, a few nights this, this month, for sure. We're going to have the same show next month uh, because Venus is still going to be hanging around, so we're going to get this opportunity again next month. And uh, the Pleiades will still be around next month, too, I'm sure, so we should be able to get a chance of that as well. Um, Emil sent me in a... Uh, picture here of the Rosette Nebula. Oh, beautiful. Look at that fantastic shot, yeah. eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, beautiful. Gorgeous, Emil. Yeah. Paul, yeah. maybe you could talk about that just for a second, what, what we're looking at. Well, basically, uh, it's, of course, it's the Rosette Nebula. How we took this photograph, um, or at least how we process it, was what they used, uh, using false color. So he would have used uh, uh, narrowband um, filters to take this. Typically, the rosette, if it was just taking with an RGB camera, would just be basically red, uh, maybe with a little candy uh, 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 beige in there. But when you're using um, a monochrome camera, you've got more flexibility, so you can use different filters. So it looks like to me like you use HA, and I'm not sure where we got the green color from. But you can create these false colors to bring out a lot more of, of the, uh, the, the detail um, that's within those nebulas. Sorry, excuse me for a second. I just got to drag something out of the way. Okay. Yep. <laughs> there we go. So anyway, yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, basically what I think is what he did with that photograph. Absolutely stunning. Uh, he did an amazing job, as Emil always does. He always does, yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, from there we've got, uh, thanks, Emil, for sending that in. Um, we have a picture here from Michael Stewart, uh, who took a photo of the night sky from Grand Bay. Oh, nice. Nice shot. Nice Milky Way. Mm. Excellent. Really nice. What do we get down the corner there? That looks like a... Looks like a, uh, an iridium or uh, maybe a satellite. <clears throat> maybe it's a it's one of the, the new ones. Yeah. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, but nice shot. Beautiful shot. Um, we've got uh, Robert Gadet here sent us in this one of Venus and the Pleiades together. Oh, nice. I guess that was taken from last night. That's cool. Lots of spikes in that shot from uh, yes. from the camera, right? Great shot. Really pretty. Uh, Tim Libby sent us these ones. Tim's got uh, 
uh, refractor telescope, I believe, or a small reflector. Uh, he's down in the um, um, St. George area. <clears throat> oh, oh excuse me a sec there, Chris. Uh, apparently, they're not seeing the pictures. Oh, sorry. Hang on a second. I oh, apologize so, so, for yeah, that. So, so we do see the photos on the screen. There we go. How's this? Okay. That might be better. Sorry about that. I'll have to wait a few <clears> seconds. <throat> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll go back out to the few that we had uh, we had looked at a second ago. Cheryl Stevens, Cheryl Stevens, sorry, that should be showing up on Facebook there now. Um, no. Okay, what have we got showing up on Facebook? Uh, there it is. There, okay, now, there, yeah. there it is. A little, bit of a little bit of a delay on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I'm looking at uh, looks to be um, Orion uh, M42. Give it a second. I might come back up to Cheryl's shot. Uh, with the crescent moon and venus crescent moon and venus yeah for those who didn't see it yeah um yeah beautiful okay. shot and uh there's a meal's shot of the rosette nebula and michael stewart's shot here of uh the milky way from grand bay are they showing up on facebook paul uh yeah i'm <clears throat> okay i'm i've got a delay so yeah okay They'll, they'll, they should still come up. Okay, there's Robert Gadet's shot uh, with this Canon T7i ISO 800, uh, 2.6 seconds, f2.8, 50 millimeter. He says, "Great shot, Robert." Yes. Really nice. Uh, Tim Libby, his shot of the Orion Nebula through the <clears> scope. Nice shot of the core. Mm, yeah. Another one from Tim here. That's a really nice shot. Oh, that's that's, that's great. That's cool, isn't it? There's Orion sitting there, and love that. It. Yeah, love that. Nice. Really special that one. Yep. Here's another one with this uh, reflector. That's cool. And Tim sent us in this one of the uh, the crescent moon as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, oh, nice. Uh, and a fifth one from Tim, actually, you have another shot of the Orion Nebula. There it is, yeah. The core there in the center. Yeah, trapezium right in that area. Now, Trudy Almond has sent us in a few shots. Uh, this is Trudy's shot from uh, April 3rd. That's uh, Venus. Venus in, the, Venus in the Pleiades, yeah. Yes. ISO 3200 f5.6, 1.6 seconds. So that's that's the Pleiades star cluster that we, uh, we had shown last night on Facebook Live, I guess, with Venus sitting inside it. Uh, only happens once every eight years, so we were lucky to get it on a clear night. And uh, there's Trudy shot of the the uh, waxing crescent moon back on March the 28th. ISO 100 f11 one thirteenth of a second. Beauty. Nice capture. And the final one here from Trudy. Uh, ISO 800. She has the the uh, waxing crescent moon Venus down here in the bottom right, and then. Um, of course, the Pleiades up there at the top. I do have one more shot. I'm trying to just need a second. Also, before you switch that, Chris, yep. um, there's, she's also got a really nice capture of the Earth shine. Oh, she does, yeah. And that's that's the other key uh, for um, for the waxing crescent moon phase, of course, is that Earth shine. That's actually sunlight that's bouncing off the Earth and bouncing back onto the moon. So we get to capture that uh, that uh, Earth shine just around those few days of of the waxing crescent there, the first few days, and then of course the first few, uh, first uh, the last few days on the other end of the cycle there. Uh, I did have one other one here. Just to give me a second, I'll try to get it. Uh, just bear with me for one second, please. So I did uh, see if I can get it up. Uh, Emma says uh, good now. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Emma, and thanks Amber for letting us know. Yes. Okay, um, <laughs> my page is updating a little bit slow here. Okay, so here's one from, uh, I'm just going to bring this over Dropbox. Uh, Peter Vissima sent me in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and, beautiful. Uh, Venus in the Pleiades. Oh, yeah. Well, and the way that, that, that uh, the aperture opened up on that <laughs> camera, mm. just, just unbelievable I, yeah. I i saw that the other night and i was just like wow well, that's yeah. just beautiful. looks like yeah. the star of bethlehem gorgeous it's really amazing yeah what you would see in charlie brown anyway <laughs> 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 
I don't want, yeah. Or was it the, the oh, sorry, the How the Grinch Stole Christmas? That's what it was in, yeah. Yeah, yeah really, really nice. Great shot there, Peter. So thanks, everybody, for, for sending all those in. Um, hey, Chris. Uh, yeah. If I may, I just want to share one with you here. Sure. Give me a sec. I'll get out of these, and I don't want to. i got to do this the right way. I'm going to hang up on you. <laughs> Look at them all. Hang on. <laughs> oh, I'll get there. Get close, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, there was one other one I wanted to just, uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention was this, uh, this last one, sorry. There, if you'd like to send in your photos, please send them in to sundaynightastronomyshow at gmail.com, all one word there, and we'd be very happy to uh, to show them on our show. So, Mike, I'm going to drop that one out of the way and let you share now. No, no worries. Okay. This, uh, this one here, when you guys were doing your show last night, I ran outside and quickly fired this one through the trees nice. beautiful kind of Venus Pallades and uh, <laughs> kind of tried to get it all in the circle of the branches the problem oh, nice. was uh i didn't take my foot pads with me and uh it, the tripod leg was sinking a bit when i was taking the shot oh it's really so nice a little, bit of, little nice. bit of star trail there nice composition just, just something nice. that i wanted to try so it looks fantastic yeah, um, it would have been nicer if the legs didn't sink <laughs> I got one. I got one. I'm going to show too. Okay, I got to stop sharing here, guys. First of all, make sure yeah. I am stopped. There, okay, I'm stopped. Yep. So, yeah, so who's on? It. You're on, yeah, Mike. Yeah, I'm just going to You're show on, you Paul. just one picture. <laughs> I get I get two mics going here and two different laptops. So, okay. uh, yeah, you got lots go. on the wall. All right. So, um, and here's a picture. Actually, I took last year, but um, it was just basically one of the harvest moons coming up. Let me see if I can share the screen. There we go. There you are. Oh, nice. And um, and at the same time, when that when that was coming up, I purposely went. This is in Bloomfield, and I, and I got that shot. And there was a car going through the bridge at the same time. And uh, so, typically, when you're doing those long exposures, you don't see cars. All you see is a flash, is these streaks of light. So it's just a, a thing a lot of photographers do around big cities. But I thought, wouldn't it be neat if I could get that bridge lit up from the inside and have those streaks going through? And, uh, and then I call this one Ghost Riders in the Sky. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's a nice picture. Beautiful. Yeah, it was kind of a fun one, right? Great capture. Yeah. yeah a lot of fun. You're right. <clears throat> Sorry. I'll okay. Uh, so we're going to go to, uh, give me a second. My phone just locked up again. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, the problem is on Google Hangouts, we can't uh, take a music video or a music uh, note and uh, play it. So uh, I have to go back and find uh, Peter's. Uh, thankfully, Peter sent me these links on uh, Dropbox. Just got to find a conversation here. Oh, I should have had this all queued up, but I was looking at Peter's photo instead. Uh, la, 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 la. Here we go. Hang on. Okay, so which one are we going to use tonight? <laughs> sent me a bunch, so let me turn up a volume. Oh, turn on boy. the volume. Okay, and I think we're ready for... Let's try it here. Here we go. Rosetta's Fun Fact. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. That's awesome every time. I never get tired of that. <clears throat> Can't get tired of that one. No. Okay. All right. So you're going to so, share your screen, Paul? I, I should be. Oh, is it okay. not sharing now? Uh, get you up there, but uh -oh. maybe our Hangout's not responding. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I had the same problem. They wouldn't share. Cancel. You were sharing a minute ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened. Um, let me just try. No, it looks like I'm hanging up for some reason. Did, it, did we tell anybody yet that we're live? Or <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, we're live. This is, this is for real. Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you want to? Uh, well, um, you know what? Maybe, maybe if this isn't going to work, if I turn this off, just I, you, I may, you may lose me altogether. Well, if you do, we just come back on on the call again. I think that's what happened with Mike, and it worked for him. If you need to, but. Yeah. Close the program. Let's okay, see what happens. Half, half you people, shut your computers off. Give us the <laughs> bandwidth for the night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come back on tomorrow. <laughs> it looks like he's frozen there now, so. 
we may have lost Paul. He's frozen on the screen. Yeah, but it's a nice shot of him. There he is. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a nice shot of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's going to join back on. Hang on. Here, here he comes. Is. There hey. he comes. Hey. Hey. You're back. hey. Hey, welcome, welcome back. back. <laughs> Let me get you on the right uh, screen on this All one. All right. Here. Hang so on. let's just pretend. There we go. And now we're going to show Rosanna's <laughs> Fun Fact. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> da, da, da. All there right. There we go. Is she up? Hey. Can you see her? We can. Hello, All Rosanna. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, we missed Rosanna last week. So this week, uh, we want to make sure we got Rosanna on. So um, anyway, so this is uh, something that Rosanna wrote. And uh, it was, um, um, she says, hi, Paul. I meant to send this on International Women's Day, which was March the 8th, which was a Sunday, but forgot and found it in my draft folder. So anyway, so we're going to, uh, we're going to put it on anyway. So this is what Rosanna writes. She says, we currently have more than 1,600 features on the moon that are named on maps and photos. If you were to guess, or maybe you already know, how many of them are named after women? 30. About half those 30 are on the far side of the moon and cannot be photographed or sketched from Earth. I didn't really pay much attention to this very lopsided detail as history is full of it until my granddaughter was looking at the moon atlas and picked up on it and the lack of female names. So how does one get a crater on the moon named after them? During the moon course that we took uh, in St. John, um, we were told that the consistent naming of features started in 1651 with uh, Giovanni Battista Riccoli Ricoli, something like that. Ricola. Ricola. Most were named after DC sci uh, DC scientists or explorers, all of which were male. Then in 1919, the International Astronomical Union uh, took over the naming of craters and other moon features. It had a rather strict structure for naming, but sometimes if insiders knew a significant backstory, a name might get approved that didn't actually meet all the criteria. So one rule was that the person had to be deceased. So thankfully, this rule didn't get stretched, uh, did get, rather get stretched to allow cosmonaut Valentina Teratovsky to be honored while still alive. So now the backstory. So here's the other stuff that goes along with this. So on one rule, or sorry, so, so now the story. So on one of Apollo 8's many tasks, was to serve as a scout for future missions, especially for the planned and hoped for mission of landing on the moon. Jim Lovell, which is in the picture you see there, um, was on the historic Apollo 8 mission and his job was to study the lunar surface with an eye toward navigation. On Apollo 8's second orbit around the moon, passing toward the Sea of Tranquility, Lovell took note of a crater, uh, Tarantius, then off to the lower ridges near the northwest edge of the Sea of Fertility. The range known as Monte's uh, Psyche Grazes Psyche Crater, named for the Jesuit astronomer Angelo Psyche. So Lovell's voice came across clearly on the radio. The mountain range was, oh, I'm going to show you that next, sorry. Okay. Boop. So uh, the mountain range has got a more contrast because of the sun angle. I can see the initial point right now, Mount Maryland. Now, Mount Maryland, Maryland, of course, being um, uh, Lovell's wife, mm. Marilyn, um, adopted from the IAU. Finally, on July 26, 2017, and that was a picture we just showed you here, um, 48 years later, the IAU decided that the name was appropriate after all, stating it was not meant to be to commemorate a specific person, Marilyn Lovell, of course, or Marilyn or Marilyn Monroe or Marilyn Manson or anybody else. It merely assigned a usual female first name to the feature. And the IAU's uh, gazetteer of planetary nomenclature is lists the origin of the simply astronaut name feature Apollo 11 site. By comparison, the original Lovell Crater on the moon's far side reads James A. Jr., American astronaut, 1928 live. So the Apollo astronauts, including Buzz Aldrin, were going to over to Mount Maryland at the present time and, and at its ignition point. So in July 1969, the triangular feature, which was 
that one, um, uh, was named after only one specific female person, and it was Marilyn Lovell. And that is this week's Rosanna's fun, fun fact. fact. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rosanna. Thank and you. it was it was it was great to see that, and, it's, and it, I've never known any of these things, so I thought that was such a great feature. So We're learning an awful lot. Much. We're learning a pile of stuff. Yes, that's, that's why these are so fun. For sure. Thanks so much, Rosanna. Yes, very much. <laughs> well, guys, I guess we're, uh, we're a little bit after nine o'clock now, 10 after nine. So I guess uh, in closing tonight, I'd like to really thank each and every one of you that are on here with us for your continued support of our efforts here. We know we're trying to uh, offer the simulcast uh, on both channels and uh, hoping that it's been coming through okay. It's all new to us, but uh, we're really enjoying the, the opportunity to be able to share what we can as far as... Uh, sharing uh, parts of the night sky with you. I wanted to remind uh, you that uh, I do, we all do love getting your photos. And again, you can send them into Sunday night astronomy show at gmail.com. I check that uh, address uh, regularly. So uh, that email, that uh, inbox. So if you have any photos that you'd like to share, please uh, send them into us. We'd love to put them up on, on the broadcast. Um, my special thanks again to Rosanna Armstrong for her fun facts episode. And of course, uh, Mike and Paul, both of you for your continued contributions to the show. <laughs> really hard to be serious now. <laughs> All right. Might as well bring them up. Yep. You know what PFO means? Please frig off. <laughs> Uh, oh, of hilarious. course, uh, Mike and Paul, for their continued contributions to the show, <laughs> I would uh, <laughs> like to uh, also ask that if you enjoyed the content here tonight, um, could you please uh, consider subscribing if you haven't already done so? Uh, so one second here. I'll get this other shot up. I would also uh, like to ask that if you could share with your friends and family that we are live on Sunday nights, uh, please do so. We're going to continue to being live at the same time at 8 p.m., uh, even if the evenings are cloudy or, or um, we're getting into our, our uh, early evening sky now where the sun is still up, we're still going to offer this this program, we believe, at 8 o'clock. So we'll continue on with that time frame as much as we can. Finally, I'd like to wish uh, all of you uh, good health and a safe week uh, coming up. I know these are tough times on all of us right now, but if we stick together and we follow the current uh, health guidelines, we will get through all of this. Uh, this too shall pass. Uh, personally, I'm really missing the outreach at the eyepiece a lot, and I uh, can't wait to have an opportunity to share the night sky with all of you once again. So remember, wash your hands, practice uh, social distancing, uh, stay at home if you can, and know that we are here to uh, help entertain you each week at the same time. So uh, for now then, uh, from Mike and Paul and I, stay safe everybody, and uh, we hope to see you all again here next week. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. And keep your scopes pointed and up. Keep your scopes pointed up. <laughs> <laughs> I got to remember to say that part every time. Thanks, folks. Take care. We'll talk to you all again soon. Good night.